Okay, uh, well, I am so happy to be here. And Martha, thank you so much for inviting me. This is awesome. I love this conference. I love that first panel. It was just a really uh, made me a lot of crossover with um, what I was going to talk about, which is the pitfalls of you know, focusing too narrowly only on one aspect of identity or one aspect of a problem. And it may be a very real problem, a very obvious problem, like the, the prior panel was talking about the very high rates of HIV infection in black, gay, and transgender community. And um, Jordan, I was so struck by what you said. It's, it's not just that we're like, you know, the cliche of what we're missing, the cause and focusing on the symptoms, which is our whole perspective is skewed, but then we generate this whole complex of advocates and organizations who are addressing this prop, very real problem in ways that are not effective, and then how do we backpedal from that when that becomes very entrenched? So uh, that really resonated with what I want to talk about, which is advocating on behalf of LGBT youth in schools and the juvenile justice system and some of these same pitfalls, but I just want to tell you first how I, how I got to these particular thoughts was the Federal Bureau of Prisons came out recently with a report about how to reduce sexual violence in federal prisons and you know most of it was great and it made sense but I was reading this report and I was just horrified by it, it spe this is you know our beloved President Obama's administration speaking very approvingly of some policies in some women's prisons that just strictly prohibit any type of physical contact, like no hugging, no patting on the back, no nothing. And it's embedded in this kind of larger framework, which I am had not heard of before. I'm just gonna confess, it's that's kind of embarrassing, but I just I hadn't. This this whole framework of these gender responsive services for incarcerated women and girls. So I started looking into this literature and uh, you know, it's, uh, some of it's very good and progressive, but a lot of it is based on this idea that women are naturally or socially more relationship oriented. And so some of the wardens in these women's prisons are talking about, oh, these women come in and they want to just form these, you know, fake families or alternative families and get into <laughs> these relationships. And, and, you know, we got to stop that. And so we just have this strict no touching rule and all this other stuff. So I was, I really, I was stunned by both the homophobia, overt practically homophobia and sexism, all this. I started looking into, well, gosh, because we do work in juvenile justice more than in, in adult settings. And I sorry, I was like, whoa, is this stuff happening in the, uh, the juvenile justice setting too? Yes, it is, uh, with girls. And so about that same time, this woman who was uh, drafting a model policy uh, for a bunch of different organizations about how to deal with all kinds of youth in the juvenile justice system contacted me and said, hey, I'm trying to figure out, do I need a separate section on LGBT youth or should I just put that under the gender responsive services section? And I was like, I, I'm like, well, I'm glad I just know about this now. But um, uh, so I can just give this person some answer about how I was like, well, I'd be kind of concerned about folding it into the gender responsive services section because, you know, how, how's it going to impact transgender kids, for example? And, you know, it seems like a lot of the gender uh, responsive services, by no means all of it, but a lot of it is based on gender stereotypes. And literally, you'll see some, some programs about how to teach you, like, how to be a young lady and have, like, appropriate table manners and dress appropriately and do makeup and stuff like that. So, um, anyway, I start looking into this, this more, and I realized there's just this massive, I'm talking massive amount of state and federal funding dedicated to creating these so-called gender-specific services in the juvenile justice system. And they really mean services for girls. That's what they mean. Um, and I'm like, okay, why did this happen? And the reason it happened, because from about like 1985 to around uh, 2002, juvenile court cases involving girls increased like dramatically by like 92% that same time period. The, the detention of girls increased by 98 percent in those years and so this is let's unleash this like all this analysis commentary like what's going on what is this some kind of social shift what's happening uh, oh and a lot of that detention is for assault a big huge chunk of it is for assault and particularly domestic battery um, and then you see books like this Hannah Rosen book, The End of Men, that's been so popular. Like she has a whole chapter on how women are becoming more violent, and she talks about these statistics like girls are becoming more violent. Um, and then at the same time as there's all this analysis trying to figure out what in the heck is going on, there's this boom in all these gender responsive services, and exactly what Jordan was talking about, just thousands of programs now 
and advocates working on this all around the country. And again, I just want to stress, some of it's good, but some of it's not so good and based on a lot of gender stereotypes. But good or bad, it all kind of takes the premise for granted that for some reason there's this huge influx of girls in the juvenile justice system and that's just the way it is and they're there and we have to serve them. But so now there's kind of a second wave and um, you know, in closer examination and some new research, it's become apparent that one of the primary reasons, perhaps, and Lee, you may have a view on this, I don't know, perhaps the primary reason that for this sudden spike in the number of girls in the juvenile justice system is not due to some sudden upsurge in, in uh, female violence. But it was, it was just a horribly unintended consequence of one aspect of the Violence Against Women Act. When it was first passed back in 1994, it had a really heavy emphasis on mandatory arrest in cases of domestic violence. So, and what would happen is that, and still does happen, is that police go to a home on a, on a DV report, and especially if you have like a single mom with a bunch of kids, and there's, you know, fighting going on, the police will just arrest the teenage daughter because they don't want to leave, they don't want to take the mother out of the home and leave all these other kids, you know, with, with no one there to take care of them. So I just want to note that that mandatory arrest emphasis in, in the Violence Against Women Act has been removed, but, it, but in the meanwhile, almost every state has enacted these mandatory arrest policies, and they're just now, some states are just now getting around to getting rid of them, but they're still very much present. So we have just this like horrifying, truly horrifying situation where this law that was passed to protect women and girls results in this huge increase in girls being ar arrested and detained for domestic battery, put into juvenile justice facilities, maybe in the pet to deal with this problem of home-based violence, and maybe in the past it might have been dealt with in the child welfare system, they don't belong in juvenile justice facilities. They should not be there. And it's also skewed in terms of race because the disproportionate number of these girls are girls of color. So you see, like, ah, it's just exposed this really big blind spot and the people, uh, you know, working on the, the first VAWA with that emphasis on arrest and enforcement, just, they just, you know, completely failed to consider what is the utterly predictable, wildly racially and economic disparate impact that that emphasis on enforcement was was going to have and just seeing gender in isolation from other factors created this really really horrible problem um, and that, so now we're seeing the same thing like similarly very tragic and very unintended effect in the response to bullying and harassment of LGBT students in schools and I know that we've all seen these horrible stories of LGBT kids who died by suicide after being bullied at school, and then that's also in the context of these bigger tragedies like Columbine and all that. So, and I know that you all, every probably everybody in here probably knows this story that that has resulted in this super aggressive push for zero tolerance policies about harassment and bullying in schools, and so now just about every state has very punitive anti-bullying policies that require schools to like immediately suspend or expel and in some cases refer out to uh, the police any kind of reported incidents of anything that could be construed as bullying or harassment. And then we've known for a while that what is happening with these policies, they don't actually help stop bullying or harassment in schools at all. They are very ineffective for that purpose but they're disproportionately enforced against youth of color, so they are a major, major part of the problem with the school-to-prison pipeline. But now there's new research <coughs> that shows that not only are those policies disproportionately enforced against youth of color, they're also just as extremely disproportionately enforced against LGBT youth, many of whom are, of course, youth of color. So, I mean, that is the, the supreme irony that these policies that were really fueled in large part by trying to protect LGBT youth are resulting in them being the ones getting suspended and expended, uh, uh, suspended and expelled, sorry, uh, when there's, you know, conflicts going on between young people because, you know, people don't come in these pre-sorted categories of this is the bully and this is the victim. These are these complex you know, social dynamics, and when teachers and school staff are trying to sort out what's going on, they're affected by homophobia and racism and sexism, so they're just as likely to target, you know, a gay kid or a transgender kid who's 
quote unquote fighting back and, ha and expel that student as um, as identify um, you know the student picking on a student for being gay. So this does have particularly bad impact on on youth who fight back. And I just give you you know we have a case now with this this young man, this wonderful young gay man. He is so just charismatic and. He moved from Arizona to Indianapolis. He loved school. He said he used to get up and just kind of wait to go to school in Arizona. He's a great student, has enormous potential. He's so smart. He moves to Indianapolis. He's very openly gay. He gets picked on every single day at school. Nobody will do anything about it. It's this giant school. His mother contacts the school. They won't help. Um, so finally, she's really afraid for him. She's afraid something, she's going to be hurt physically. And she buys this thing for him called a self protective flashlight. That's the label on the box. It emits this loud noise and a burst of light and a, an electrical charge. Not a strong one, but you know, an electrical charge. So sure enough, he gets surrounded by a bunch of other kids. He whips out this thing and sets off the noise, and they all run off and would probably save him from being you know, possibly really hurt, just like his mother was worried about. And so what does the school do? You know, they, they expel him. And then they and do nothing about these kids who are ganging up on him. Then they send him to, they're like, well, the only way you can come back to school is if you'll go to this alternative school for kids with behavioral problems. And, you know, you can just see, there, this is the school to prison pipeline in action, if that's, you know, if that's what had happened. I mean, we were, you know, it's like a needle in a haystack, but he managed to find us. And we got him in another school and we're suing that school district. But, you know, for that, we're, this is one kid, you know, that's not an adequate response to the systemic problem. And then, so this, I think these policies are part of, not the whole explanation, but part of a, a surge in the number of LGBT youth in the juvenile justice system. I mean, there's recent uh, studies that show 12 to 13 percent of all the kids in juvenile justice facilities are LGBT. That's a lot. I mean, that is like wildly two or three, maybe four times their numbers in the general population. I mean, there's other things involved there too with parental rejection and all that. But anyway, completely unacceptable situation. But I'm already, what I don't want us to do is what sort of happened with the, the surge in girls in the juvenile justice system. But that is sort of happening already. It's like, we're like, okay, well, there's all these kids in the LGBT kids in the juvenile justice system. We were to come with best practices for serving them, uh, new, new programs and all that to serve them. It's like, no, you know, let's let's take a, we do need to do some of that, but let's take a lesson from what happened with the girls and see if we can shift the focus to how to keep those youth out of the juvenile justice system, not just you know, come up with ever more nonprofit organizations and advocates to serve them in the juvenile justice system. And I will stop there. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah.